Uh, so today it's my uh, great honor to introduce Deming Chen uh, as our speaker. Uh, he's a professor at the uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I know him in the context of uh, reconfigurable computing and, and uh, GPUs. Uh, he's done work in uh, high-level synthesis, computational genomics, and today he's here to talk about machine learning on, uh, on heterogeneous computing. So. Please. So uh, thank you very much, Ken. So it's uh, my great pleasure to share with you guys some of our recent uh, research uh, activities and results. Right. So I'm a big fan of uh, Microsoft. I'm a big fan of uh, Bill Gates, actually. So you know, see, uh, actually, this is also a good dream coming true for me. Okay. The good thing is, uh, you know, one of my PhD students, uh, Si Tao, is sitting in the audience, and right, he's a summer intern here, right? So things all connected very well. Okay, so the title of my talk is "Cognitive Computing on Heterogeneous Hardware Systems for the AI Revolution." Okay, so uh, of course we have been working on heterogeneous computing, IPGA, uh, GPU, like, like what Ken uh, introduced. Uh, however, the AI thing is uh, pretty recent. Uh, I became quite interested uh, with uh, artificial intelligence in general. And uh, then also, since last year, we have a center uh, on cognitive computing in Illinois, uh, right? I mainly sponsored by IBM. And we uh, basically also donate quite some hardware, right? So we're working on uh, you know, across the whole stack, right? Alg algorithms, accelerations, applications. So then, you know, uh, so uh, actually one of my focused effort these days is in AI and the IPG acceleration of the AI workloads. Okay, so then people may wonder why AI and why now, right? So uh, I summarize it with several kind of uh, aspects, right? The first of all, we have the big data, right? Every day, large and unstructured data flood us, right? From Facebook, from Google, you know, social media, right? And then as a result, uh, suddenly you have a huge uh, amount of data that you can use to train, right? So um, for, for example, for Facebook, uh, you have so many labeled faces. Right, then naturally you can use those as a raw material to train for machine intelligence, let's say for facial recognition. Right? For Google, so many different countries are using it, right? Then suddenly you have so much raw material, just try for machine translation. Right? So you know, um, the data really for artificial intelligence is the driving force behind it. And then next, so we have all this data and in the same time, we also have cloud computing, right, emerging as one of the affordable computing platform for us. So we do not need to have a, like a, you know, 500 uh, nodes in our backyard, right, in order to run the uh, heavy workload, right. As long as uh, we can access, uh, for example, to Microsoft Cloud, to Amazon Cloud. Right? And uh, uh, we are able to generate some really meaningful results already. And in the same time, right, so the deep neural network uh, become uh, really kind of revived, right? And uh, starting about five, six years ago, right? So at the beginning, people still have some doubts, right? Because neural network has been around for a long time, right? So what's new for this round? And then uh, later on, many people convinced, right? So actually, this thing is quite natural because it's imitating how people, how little children are learning, right? And so based on the uh, images, based on, based on speeches, right? Deep neural network is able to recognize the intrinsic features specific, right? To the, to, to the image or speech or language. And uh, so that's why you can improve the overall accuracy, right? And then finally, uh, we have uh, hardware advances, right? Such as GPU, IPGA, 
or even dedicated ASIC TPU, right? So now Google is talking about TPU2, right? So then what does it mean with all these things? So then naturally, right, so people are thinking or advocating that AI is the next round of industry revolution, right? So we have uh, maybe every 30 years, you have one revolution, right? The, the, our current revolution is the information technology, right? So what's the next one, right? So many people believe AI, right, will be the one that will permeate our daily lives, right? So if you think about all kinds of applications, right, ranging from insurance, uh, flaw detection, artificial limbs, and uh, all these things, right, eventually, Right, boil you down with uh, data, analy uh, data analytics, right, boil you down with some computing platform so you can provide real-time real analysis results that you can use to make some decisions. Right? Eventually, uh, hope, our hope is artificial intelligence can help human beings right, in uh, different, uh, all kinds of aspects to improve our uh, daily lives. Okay, so on top of this, there's another segment, right? This so-called IoT, Internet of Things, right? So which is emerging and also evolving very fast. Okay, so people are talking about smart city, smart home, smart manufacturing, wearable devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they are like the sensors or the failures, right? You know, uh, <laughs> spread out in the world. And then they collect all the data. And then at the back end, we have the cloud computing. right? So we may have some uh, uh, like a machine learning workload running in the cloud computing that supply the intelligence for the sensors. right? So uh, overall, um, you can imagine, uh, indeed, in the near future, uh, we can evaluate and we can face a brand new kind of industry uh, that can uh, help us in different aspects. Okay, so then let's focus on one type of uh, kind of uh, industry, an uh, emerging industry, is so-called uh, cognitive computing. Okay, so then what is cognitive computing? Okay, so I don't know whether you guys heard about this term before. So anybody heard about this term before? This is okay. <laughs> All right, and. Uh, so uh, there's no widely agreed upon definition for cognitive computing yet. Okay. Uh, usually, it means the computing system that mimics the functioning of the human brain and helps to improve human decision making. Okay. So this one focuses on the interaction between machine and human. Uh, why? So this is uh, one definition from IBM. Systems that learn at scale, reason with purpose, and interact with humans naturally. Okay. So then cognitive computing can learn from rich data, right? So we just talk about big data, right? Reason from models, we need to build some models, okay? And then most importantly, interact with us to perform complex tasks better than either humans or machines can do by themselves. So then the goal is to basically make um, one plus one greater than two. Okay, so that's the goal here. And then you realize, oh, okay, so then naturally it will cover a bunch of different things, right? So then here I list uh, the different stacks for the cognitive computing, right? On the top, we have the cognitive application solutions, right? And actually, it's a pretty broad, right? If we Try to follow that definition, right? So then ranges from uh, autonomous vehicle, right? Virtual reality, personal health care, chatbot, right? So all these devices, um, uh, right? You can treat them as devices, large and small, all interacting with people, right? And then uh, there's this middleware services or libraries uh, from uh, IBM, uh, from Amazon, from Microsoft, right? Azure. Uh, from Google, et cetera, et cetera. And then also underneath, we have heterogeneous infrastructures offered uh, you know, from hardware companies, uh, mainly from hardware companies, but you know, people are leveraging 
this hardware and building different kind of frameworks right, to really make people's life or people's dream come true. Right? And on the other hand, uh, there are also some consortium um, that uh, come in. Right? For example, OpenCAPI is uh, uh, like an open consortium uh, pushed by Microsoft. Right? Their goal is to make uh, my, uh, micro uh, processor easily accessible to different type of accelerators, whether it's GPU or IPDA. As long as they talk the common interface, right, then they can be put together. And then you can also access to some heterogeneous IOs or different kind of memories. right. So um, you know, basically try to build a community in order to build the hardware system right, easily. Right, and then support all these different uh, stack of, uh, um, you know, uh, either from application point of view or firmware point of view, right, make the whole stack work. Okay, so then uh, for cognitive computing acceleration, so this is a part of uh, my specialty, uh, or, you know, uh, it's also very fun to, to work with because. I can deal with both software and hardware, right? So we as engineers, and sometimes we want to really make the whole system work, right? So then uh, this includes uh, several aspects, right? So we have been working on. So the first one is uh, uh, you know, uh, open source, a set of cognitive uh, workload benchmarks. Uh, this can include RRCN, right? So actually I have more uh, results uh, in terms of IRC, and we make the whole IRC and work. And then AlexNet, LSTM, right, ResNet. Uh, ResNet is developed by, by Microsoft, right? So it, it actually won the ImageNet competition a couple of years ago, right? Then GoogleNet. And then uh, some uh, complete workflow that can start from TensorFlow, right? Offer from Google. And then you, people use that to develop uh, deep ne uh, neural network type of models. And then we can uh, try to build an open source flow, take that model and map to IPGA, right? And then on top of that, uh, we can work on the benchmarks, right? And then try to map to IPGA, try to map to GPU, compare them. And, or when you have a workload coming in, how can we quickly analyze it and then see which one which type of hardware platform is most suitable for this uh, uh, benchmark, uh, right? And then uh, eventually, after we get some open copy machines, uh, we also want to uh, map all these benchmarks there. Okay. So then, the third item here is to develop a principled methodology for acceleration. Okay. So um, our uh, main driving force is high-level sensors. Okay. So uh, Hello Census is uh, uh, it's not a new idea. However, it really started to kind of catch real serious uh, traction since about uh, six, seven years ago. And right now, the main IPJ companies are using this very heavily, right? Uh, both Xilinx and uh, Altara Intel. Okay. So, uh, with the hardware synthesis as the driving force, and then we can enable hardware software partitioning for heterogeneous systems. Some new work that we did, right? So I'm going to share. So for the hardware synthesis part and hardware software part, I'm uh, going to share with the audience uh, for our recent uh, new results. And we also start to work on near memory acceleration. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I don't think I have time to uh, share about this one uh, today. Okay. So then let's uh, take a look at this case study. Right? It's uh, called um, uh, Long-Term Recurrent Convolution, uh, uh, Convolutional Network. Okay. So it's a video recognition and uh, description architecture. So uh, it uh, consists of AlexNet. Okay. So it's uh, just a... Uh, deep neural network that's good to recognize all kinds of objects in the image. And then it's driving a LSTM, right, long short term uh, memory. And then uh, it's also a um, uh, neural network. It's a recurrent neural network. It has some memory. So then it's pretty good to analyze the logic, right, 
So then, uh, so uh, actually it's uh, pretty popular um, in the speech recognition and things like that. And then put all together, then uh, what, what we can do is we can shoot real-time video, okay? And then analyze the image and then output the description of that image, right? So then this become like a video content uh, uh, kind of analyzer, right? So suppose you have a UAV, right? So just give you one application. You have a UAV that's flying, right? Then you can recognize the scene, right? And then based on that, you can make some decisions, okay? So uh, what we want to do is we want to take the high-level census approach to map the RRCN to IPGA, okay? So uh, if you haven't heard about high-level census, this is a typical design flow, right? So the goal is we have so many more software engineers than hardware engineers, right? Not everyone is uh, uh, pretty uh, familiar with the hardware language, okay? So, but many people are working with high-level language such as C, C++. So then what we do is we'll use C, C++ to describe the algorithm, right? To describe your application, and then we will generate the hardware for you, okay? So this itself is like an AI process because it's trying to imitate the hardware engineer to write the hardware, right? So then, yeah, C++, uh, C, C++ uh, they may not be synthesizable, meaning that uh, not every C, C++ code can be translated into hardware, right? For example, if you have dynamic memory allocation, that the CPU can handle, but IPGA cannot really handle. It doesn't really understand how do you uh, dynamically allocate, uh, you know, uh, memory. Or if you have, uh, uh, you know, your, a command uh, writing a bunch of text to a file, IPGA doesn't understand that either because it doesn't really have an operating system. It's a piece of hardware supposed to accelerate some computation for you, right? Okay, so then. Fine, let's say we make sure all the code is synthesizable, then make sure the C-level code, you know, verified and, uh, you know, everything's fine. And then go through the high census. Right here we can handle, mainly trying to handle the parallelization well, because the reason I want to map this thing to IPGA is try to get some acceleration, right? Then so people are reporting sometimes hundreds of acceleration, hundreds times faster, right? So I'll show some results later. And so how do we deal with uh, all these things, all right? So functions, loops, arrays, and trade-off, right? So these are the building blocks for the IPGA. And then uh, one important thing is how do we make sure the computation memory can be handled well, right? So uh, the memory part uh, will not become a bottleneck. Okay, so here is the example, right? So let's say you are shooting the video, right? So here this image, at the end, the RRCN should output something like this, a group of young men playing a game of soccer, okay? All right, so then we analyze some uh, complexity, right? So altogether, this actually is a large um, uh, network, right? So uh, people usually use a uh, uh, number of parameters, right? So number of weights, Right, to evaluate how large the new neural network is. And then, um, so 86 million weight data is, uh, is actually pretty large, okay? And then we have about 2.2 uh, gig operations per, section, uh, per, per second, right? That's the requirement. And then you have this amount of data, right? So then the IPGA on-chip memory is not large enough to hold all this data. So then we have to make sure the data can be streamlined into the IPGA. Right, in such order, right? So then you have you can have high effective memory bandwidth, okay? And uh, so we did some uh, uh, analysis. So this is basically for uh, which layer, you know, what's the number of weights and things like that. And then we also analyzed for different type of layers: convolutional, uh, fully connected, uh, R uh, right? These are, are the the most major ones what's the uh, ratio between computation and memory, and then we try to deal with them uh, with different strategies. For example, for the fully connected, you don't have, have a lot of computation. However, you have a lot of memory requirement, right? So then for these ones, what do we do to make sure the data can be uh, effectively 
uh, fed to the IPGA, right, or shared, right, to minimize the overall latency. By the way, if you have questions, please feel free to stop me. I think we have enough time to discuss some uh, details. Okay. And then uh, some other challenges, right? So um, unclear allocation scheme and partitioning and uh, tiling factors. So uh, this is, uh, uh, our goal is to have high parallelization. So we want to map all the layers to IPGA, right? And then we can do pipelining, right? So then in such a way, all the resources will be busy all the time. However, uh, because uh, the different characteristics of the layers, so how do we really allocate resource? You have limited resource. The IPG has a limited size, right? So all those different type of lots and all that, uh, right? So how do we allocate them? And then in such a way, given the limit, we can maximize all our performance, right? So then uh, that's one of the challenges and we actually developed some theory behind it uh, to guide it. And then in terms of uh, limited on-chip memory and memory access bandwidth, um, uh, we actually come up with uh, some uh, prefetching, right? So if uh, you work with uh, uh, computer architecture, that's a, a familiar concept, but we use it for IPGA, right? And then we also do some data layout optimization, right? So make sure we really can feed the data very efficiently to the hardware, okay? So then let's take a look at resource allocation. So we developed some theory and we call it the resource allocation management. Uh, this is a, a realm, right? So what we do is we analyze resource allocation among the layers and determine the most efficient allocation to minimize total network latency given the limitations in IPG resource. And then, so here is a simple model, right? So you have many layers, right? So let's say computation demand of layer I is CI. Resource consumed by that layer is RI, okay? So then the total latency is uh, basically CI divided by RI summing over all the layers. Of course, this uh, we are making some assumption. Uh, we are um, basically, the assumption is uh, uh, memory is not a bottleneck, right? So then if you have more computation, you, it runs faster. If you have more, sorry, if, you have, if it has more computation, then, you know, with a fixed resource, it will take longer. But if you have, uh, can allocate more resource, then uh, the computation overall time will be minimized, assuming you will have all the data, right? So then in order to uh, make this true, indeed, those tricks to make data available to the accelerator all the time need to be realized, right, in order for this uh, resource, for the realm to work. But let's see, that's the case. And then we go through some, you know, this is a Gauchi inequality, right? And then eventually what we get is, here's the guideline, okay? So um, the resource allocation for the different layers should be kind of a proportional to the ratio of the square root of the computation need, okay? So then uh, we actually um, uh, evaluated this. And so just a simple evaluation, uh, let's say we take two layers as example, right? So just two layers in a deep neural network. Let's say the computation requirement is one to two. And then we do the realm, right, do the square root, and then find out, okay, you should uh, allocate about 41% resource to layer one and 58% resource to layer two, okay? So then we actually go through a bunch of logic sensors and because this, uh, uh, this is pretty high level, right, guidance. And then we go through a bunch of resource, uh, you know, logic sensors and evaluate. And indeed, and, and the, uh, we find out uh, our resource allocation. So this one is about 41%. This one about for, uh, 58%. And they match with the, the best solution for both layers. OK? All right. So then um, that's one technique we developed, right? So try to guide the resource allocation. And in the same time, um, 
Uh, the goal of Hydro Census, probably you already know, is to improve pro, uh, design productivity, right? So people can just write C code, C++ code, right? And they do not need to deal with the low-level hardware description. And then the Hydro Census engine will gen gen generate hardware for you. So then uh, another te technique is uh, intellectual property, right? So then well, naturally think about, can we develop some uh, Hello Census IPs for machine learning, right? So because, you know, um, machine learning, they are mainly dealing with several typical type of layers, right? The structure is pretty regular, right? And then looks like we can develop some IPs. So these are the high level IPs that can be reused across the different layers, right? So actually, both convolutional layer and the fully connected layer can be translated into matrix multiplication, right? So then we can develop some IPs that's doing Mac uh, product, uh, you know, uh, operation and then share them across different layers. So that's what we did. So then, uh, uh, so for this one, right, so we actually developed some other tree. You have some multiplication and other tree. We even put pipelining. So, so for the IP, it's a pipeline IP, okay? So then it can definitely help uh, on the throughput. And then, of course, the other tree gave you a logarithmic um, reduction, right, in terms of uh, overall latency, right? And then uh, we can uh, reuse these different IPs for, uh, for the machine learning layers. Uh, for example, this is a convolutional layer. It has uh, input, it has 48 channels, output it, have, uh, it has 128 channels, right? So it has, uh, uh, so the filter size is five by five and the, uh, uh, the feature map is 27 by 27. But then we can see, we can partition it, right? In a tiled fashion, and then we can just instantiate this IP many times, right? So then we can improve the uh, parallelization. In the same time, it's a pretty flexible, right? So it really depends on what's the computation need for this particular layer, right? Because the, the size are different. And then we can instantiate, right, how many of the IPs and, right, and wave them together and then uh, deliver the uh, optimized solution. Okay, so then there are some other techniques. I don't have time to go into the details. We also try the network pruning, right? And uh, so we prune the network and then we do retraining. We have about 1% accuracy loss. However, we reduce actually, uh, a lot, um, you know, then and now the weight really got reduced, right? So then it can help us to speed up the overall system and then it will definitely uh, 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 mitigate the uh, memory issues, okay? And then we also use a fixed point, right? So instead of a uh, uh, floating point, the fixed point can really help us in terms of overall storage and, and performance. And then in terms of specific memory handling, we use the FIFO for a uh, weight uh, prefetch, right? Because the pattern is uh, uh, kind of predictable. We can analyze them and prefetch the data and then we also use this ping pong buffer. So let's say between two layers, we have two buffer, right? So this is a so-called ping pong buffer. Well, so then uh, we can also uh, uh, allocate more BRAM. So while you are ex uh, executing on one BRAM, the, un uh, the other buffer is grabbing data to feed the other BRAM, right? And then you swap, right? So then this can effectively effectively high the memory latency. So then it can also make the resource allocation scheme work for us, okay? All right, so this is our system. So, so we have a front end, it has a uh, webcam, okay? And then also a TK1. So, you know, because we just have the TK1 and so we just use it for some pre-processing, it doesn't need to be a TK1. Actually, TK1 is an overkill, but it's available. So what we do is, uh, you know, the webcam is uh, uh, 1080p, right? So then we downsample it, right, to feed into uh, this IPGA be because AlexNet uh, uh, actually work with uh, uh, like a 244 by 244 type of image, okay? 
So then we have the IPDA uh, in a different room, and then the, all the uh, frames send over the internet. We have power meter and everything. And so here is the final results. Okay, so uh, we evaluate. So this, we use the Vertex 7, okay, and then evaluate against the NVIDIA K80. So actually, they are using the same um, uh, LISO, right? So similar amount, uh, amount of transistors, okay. And then we also compare to a high end uh, Intel um, CPU. So then, overall, for single image latency, Right, so our latency is 0 0.04. So then that means uh, it can handle 25 frames per second. Right, so this is really close to, to real time. Uh, however, for NVIDIA, it takes 0 0.14, uh, 124 second. So we actually have about 3x speed up over the GPU. Okay, and then for the Intel, so the, for this one, it has a uh, actually a large cache, and we. Uh, do, did a lot of optimization, and then, uh, but you know, our speed up is uh, about uh, 4.75x. So Intel, this is the power of Intel. That's power. So everything is measured. So overall, we have about 18x lower energy compared to both GPU and uh, and the CPU, right? So, uh, so then the idea is. Um, Let's say indeed we have the IPGAs in the cloud, right? Just like those IPGAs used in the Bing search engine, right? So uh, eventually, let's say IPGA can be made available to the customers, right? So then the question is, how do you really program the IPGA in order to get this kind of good results, right? So, so for us, we, we take several months you know, some students and try this and try that. Of course, uh, we need to, uh, you know, invent something like the real, like the, the memory layout and all that. So then later on, how can we port this to a kind of a production, right? So then the, uh, the users of the cloud can get access to this, work with their own workload and map to the IPG and gain the similar speed up. Right, so then that's the goal. So I think we definitely have some good opportunity to to really collaborate and you know, and maybe how can work on something like this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So any questions so far before I switch gear? All right. Okay. So uh, now let me switch uh, gear and talk about the system on chip. Uh, although this is a system on chip. But um, uh, actually, this uh, framework, the overall methodology, is um, can be used for designing of general heterogeneous computing systems, right? Uh, uh, but uh, let me motivate the whole work by this uh, SOC design, right? So complexity. So first of all, we have the complexity, right? That's skyrocketing, right? So just by the number of IPs used per design, right? And then also the cost of the high-end SOC. Okay? So then, because of all this, we have to come up with some solutions. So this $164 million, it's not just the manufacturing cost. A lot of that cost comes from the design, comes from the verification. right? So this is basically the man power and uh, behind the design cost. right? So then people proposed all kinds of uh, Solutions, right? Virtual platform, right? For hardware software co design, System C, right? With TLM 2.0, Hello Synthesis, from a vacation, IP reuse, and all that. Uh, uh, however, um, a lot of these things are kind of point solutions. So then our goal is how to combine all this and come up with a holistic solution, right? To target basically the design complexity of uh, high-end SOCs, okay? So that, let's review the hardware software co-design process, right? So uh, these days, a lot of, so for very complicated SOC design, it's almost always started with high-level language these days, right? So it's a C, C++, and then, you know, the uh, designer, system designer, software designer, Right, talk to the marketing people, right? So they come up with 
this, this C code or C++ code that's treated as the golden model, right? So that's the execution specification, right? So you can just run this code and, and, and you know, you can even run with the real test vectors and generate the outputs, right? You go through software type of debugging and everything, and then people are happy with this. Okay, that's the gold model. But then how do you uh, start from here and then eventually come out with SOC to implement the same thing, right? So then uh, we have the CPU side, we have the accelerator side, right? And then the question is which parts of the application should go to hardware and which part go to the software? Right, so then that's why we have this hardware software partitioning, right? A lot of times people just do profiling and then manually partition it, right? That's still the current uh, kind of uh, way to do it. However, you know, if you do not, because, uh, you know, when it's uh, compli complicated, you know, we just mentioned you can have even IPs, you can have hundreds of them. That's right? so a large design space and, you, you know, if you have bad decision, then you end up with high communication costs, complicated dependency, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we really automate? How do we really uh, improve, right? So it's, it's an old topic. However, people tried and uh, I uh, haven't really seen very successful projects that uh, uh, actually moved into uh, the real commercial product. Right, so the system level tools these days are still really falling behind, right? So this is a new effort by us and uh, uh, we want to, uh, you know, uh, because we can build some interesting model, high level model work targeting both software and the hardware, right? Especially for the hardware that's enabled through high level sensors because high level sensors can quickly evaluate the overall design space and then we are able to build a system level model and then target the large design space, right? So let me share with you the most recent results uh, we did. So here to, to automate the hardware software co-design, we need, uh, uh, you know, at least these several actions, items, right? Consider different hardware and software implementations of each co code region for acceleration, right? And uh, right, so uh, even for software, you can have different implementations. Would it be like uh, x86, or would it be a quad core from ARM, right? So it ha definitely have different performance and power. How do you really quickly model that? Okay, so then for hardware, of course, uh, it's uh, uh, the design space is even more uh, broad. So I will show you some results to. Uh, uh, to um, uh, kind of uh, explain why that's the case. And then uh, after that, we need to accurately model the entire system and all its components, right? So, and uh, after you have a good model, then you can use the model to guide your event space exploration, right? So, so if that's the case, then immediately we, have, we, we need to ask all these different questions and then our contribution is the automated software hardware partitioning framework by tackling these three challenges. So what do we do? We have high level accurate hardware software modeling, task graph generation algorithm to capture key features of the system, and randomized IOP algorithm to draw the design space efficiently. Okay, so let me see my time. Okay, so uh, this is a simple kind of overview about hardware software code design, right? So you start with the back, right? Hardware software partitioning and then software, then hardware, right? So then if that's the case, let's just take a, like a divide and conquer approach. Let's do the, you know, the mainly three part or I'll focus on this part and that part, right? So well, let's do the software modeling first, okay? So, um, so I don't know, so uh, do you guys mainly work on software or hardware? Who mainly work on software? Oh, sweet. And the rest is working on hardware? Okay, all right, great. So then uh, hopefully, you know, um, uh, for the software people, you can learn about something about hardware <laughs> and the vice versa, right? And, uh, but then hardware, software, 
software code design naturally means okay, you have to do both, right? And then design, right? Code design, okay. So then, code, then go for the software, automate, automatic software modeling framework with desired features. You may wonder, hey, software modeling, what's new about this, right? So many people worked on it. But our main goal is we try to use this to do hardware software code design, which can be, you know, there's a large dense space. So our main goal is to speed, speed up, right? So speed hundreds of speed up without too much loss of the accuracy. That's the motivation, okay? So let's uh, look at the software modeling, right? So, um, so we actually uh, target the loops, okay? Because uh, uh, this, this is a 1090 rule, right? So 90% uh, of the execution time is spent on 10% of the source code, right? So you have to understand the, the loops very well because they just uh, vary, they become very computation intensive. So what we do is uh, we use this so-called regions of interest idea. So let's say you have these loops. Right, what we do is we partition them into M regions of interest, right? So then immediately you can think about this. If I can model each of these regions in parallel, right? So then I have a MX speed up, right? So that's a very trivial observation. So then how do we do it? So then what we do is we can actually uh, do a fast forward. Right? So then let's see, we have M threads, and we throw each of this region to one thread. But when you do the modeling or simulation, right? so this uh, we actually use simulation, simulation based, and then we'll do fast forward. Right? So we always start from the beginning, do fast forward. And so that many uh, simulators, they have this fast forward feature. And then we can generate condition. right? So this is uh, like a a precondition for this region of interest, right? So for, for example, the state of the cache and all that, those are very important for you to accurately model these different regions. So then you can do that. So, but then at most you, you have MX speed up. How do we achieve hundreds of speed up, right? So that's the question. So what we do is, um, Actually, we observe that many applications have different faces, right? So for example, for this correlation, this one, right? So because of a branch misprediction, cache misses, st structure hazard, and things like that, you know. So then we can actually model these faces using piecewise linear uh, strategy. And then if that's the case, let's say we take this out, and then we really do not need to uh, estimate the, you know, using the ROI to estimate the whole thing here. As long as we can estimate the uh, performance here and there, right, and the rest can be just accurately modeled, right? So then, so then the, now the question is how do we identify these different phases to really reduce the number of simulation points, right? So, in the paper, we have quite some details, and so due to the time limit, uh, I will not go into all the details. But uh, let's say we did it, and we did it perfectly, and then what will be the final results? Um, you know, I'll skip the, this, this part. This is mainly uh, trying to make sure, because we are doing software hardware co-design, right? So uh, eventually, we we'll want, want to enable virtual platform, right? where you have software and hardware, how do they talk to each other? They use system C, right? So what we do is we have the software model. After the model, we can generate some system C wrappers, right? So it can generate for both the computation component and the memory and just using the system C TLM 2.0. And so then we can enable high level hardware software code design simulator, right? So that can be used as our uh, kind of uh, a ground truth uh, evaluation. Oh, okay, sorry. So then uh, let's look at the overall speed up. So we evaluate uh, did, uh, our um, uh, solution against both uh, Gen5 and Sniper, right? So uh, these are the two popular kind of software modeling simulators. 
And then we uh, gain indeed hundred, hundreds of speed up, especially a lot of speed up against Gen 5. So, and then uh, our average latency and energy error is very well controlled. Right? So then this indeed can be used as a building block for system level modeling, right? at least for the software side. OK, so then let's move on. Let's talk about hardware modeling. Right, so we talk about software, let's move on to the hardware side. So what's the challenge on hardware? Okay, so the goal is to develop automa automatic hardware modeling framework with desired features. Right? So then let's look at the hardware models. So what are the challenges? First of all, how to actually model performance and power early on. Right? So if you have a high level representation that's actually quite difficult because you have no gate level physical information available. Secondly, how to automate system design process, right? So that, let's take a look at this typical system level design process, right? I kind of explained it before. And you start with C, C++, right? hardware software partitioning, and then uh, people usually do this virtual platform, right? Because it's an SOC. Right, you have all kinds of IPs and bus systems, and right. So model it, model it, make sure the overall functionality is correct, right. So then after the model, then you have uh, uh, some uh, uh, you know options because you do the system C modeling. This system C may not be even synthesizable for high level sensors, right? although it's a C plus plus code, and then you have to either re-implement using synthesizable system C, or you write everything again using RTL, right? So this, this whole flow is very real. That's, that's what people are fighting every day, okay? So then if you look at this, all kinds of manual thing, right? So we talk about, okay, hardware software code design is manually done, and then this is manually done, right? That's manually done, The overall it's a very slow process. That's why you have, $164 million right, to really make this work. So what's the third challenge? How to explore the large DN space? Let's say even you did all this, but then you are RTL designer, you're just implementing one type of architecture, right? So you know, that's why they, um, you know, it's a sleepless in Seattle, is that right? So, why? Because they realize maybe there's a better design out there, and I cannot do it right? with the limited time and manpower. Okay? So it's a huge design space, how to find optimal implementation. That's the next big challenge. So how do we really solve all this? Right? So actually, our approach directly tackles these three problems. Okay? So you know, system C generation, modeling, and design space exploration. How do we do it? So the first one, we'll use polyhedron-based power and latency calculation and estimation. So I'll explain this in detail pretty soon. And automatic system C generation and analytical power and latency modeling. Okay. And then the third, fast accelerator design space exploration. Okay, so let me explain some details. So here is the high-level view. Our, uh, for our accelerator system C generation and design space exploration flow. Okay. We should really come up with a cool name to capture all this. And maybe we should uh, write a journal paper or something, right? And so how do we, so for the first one, it's automated C to system C transformation. So, uh, you know, uh, I explained that people use system C and it may not be synthesizable and all that. So fine. So then we'll generate system C code then we have full control, then, you know, systems, we generate synthesizable system C for, right, for you, okay? Then we can run hydro synthesis on top of that. So uh, the, uh, the better thing is uh, after that, we can categorize, right? So because we use polyhedron model, it have very powerful anal uh, uh, you know, anal analyzing kind of capability. Uh, we can actually categorize one tile of the whole loop, and then use that tile as a building block to categorize the uh, performance and the power. And then, based on that, we can come up with analytical power and latency model, and then use that to, 
to drive a fast event-based explorer. Okay, so it's a, actually each stage is enable the next stage, right? So as I mentioned here, if I can just characterize one tile, then it's one design space, and then we can expand that into entire design space, and then generate the performance power Pareto curve based on our fast uh, design space exploration. Okay, so then uh, I'll uh, skip all the details, and uh, so let's look at some results. So uh, here, uh, so blue dots from the design space, right? So this is a real uh, benchmark. So uh, this is uh, going through, kind of exhaustively going through the design space and, right, and then measure it, uh, right, run a detailed simulation. And this one is based on our model, right? So the model I just explained. And you can see actually they're pretty close and especially on the uh, frontier, the Preto curve, the pretty much match, right? Latency power, so there's a, such an error, right? But it's, a, it's controlled, right? It's so similar to the software model, modeling error we, we, we saw. So then uh, this can actually have quite some advantage. So let's say for this benchmark, right? So this benchmark is a communication dominated. You just by evaluating this, right? So then that's why if you compare these two points, for this one, I throw in a lot of resource. That's why you have much higher power. However, the latency is not reduced too much because it's a memory dominated, right? So then if that's the case, if I'm willing to suffer 4% latency, right, longer latency, and then I can reduce power by 70% already, right? So then for this one, if it's a, a kind of a computation dominated design, then you can do effective uh, kind of uh, power latency trade-off. So now we have the model for the software and we have the model for the hardware and then we can really do the co-design, right? So we have the building blocks done. So then this is actually the latest work is going to appear at DAC 17. So what we do is um, we use the LLVM, right? So you're probably familiar with uh, this uh, compiler framework developed by affect a member from the CS uh, department of UIUC. What we do is we identify some hot regions, right? So this is uh, basically, we actually um, uh, also evaluate uh, uh, some real workload and then we can evaluate the branch probability, right? So you have the control flow, you have the data flow. So certain paths can be activated much more, right? So then we, uh, pu uh, put down more weights for those, but then we extract uh, the uh, parallelism, you know, based on the branching and all that. So then we create a graph, right? So this graph is uh, in the middle between the conventional task graph and the LLVM. So LLVM uh, IR is operation level, and conventional task graph, and you know. Those uh, are more coarse-grained, but then we have something in the middle, so then that can dramatically reduce the complexity for the ILP. So how does this work? So we identify how, how, how the regions, those are the candidates to be mapped to the hardware side. Okay? So then to really reduce the design space for this region, you know, we, we, we can do software modeling, we can do hardware modeling, right? And then we combine and we have a common Preto curve. That's the trade-off across the entire design space between software, let's say software, you know, it's one core, two core, or hardware, the hardware I just show you, there's a curve there even, right? So you have this whole thing captured here. However, how do we do ILP? What do we do is we do some sampling and then annotate all these samples into each of these nodes, right? Each node has a different Preto curve. Do the sampling, do the annotation, and then we, we can do the LP formulation and solve it. After we solve it, then each node will have one solution for us, right? Whether it's a software, whether it's hardware. If it's a hardware, what's the trade-off there, right? And then what we do is we want to find the next level, more fine-grained solution. So then we actually zoom in, and then this is called design space localization. We zoom in here and do resampling, okay? 
So then after that, right, so we can go through several iterations until we complete the whole design, right? So then we can provide very fine grain solution, but then uh, reduce the design space uh, search. Okay, so then let's uh, uh, look at the results for this one, right? So, uh, so this is the entire result, right? So we have the software modeling, hardware modeling, system level modeling, and then we can automate the software, software, hardware, software co-design. So then let's compare to some traditional kind of solutions such as simulity kneeling, okay? Because you have a large DN space, a lot of time people use simulity kneeling. And in general, we are 53x faster than simulity kneeling. And then uh, for co covariance, both algorithms found the same results, while for the other benchmarks, our result outperformed simulity kneeling. Okay, so this is from performance point of view. And then here, we then also compare the optimality, right? So for these three benchmarks, they are relatively small. So what we did is we, we did an exhaustive search in order to find the optimal solution. And then for all these three, when we have the exhaustive solution, we all match the optimal uh, solution. For the rest, the optimal solution just takes too long, cannot get it. So that's why we only reported our solution. And in the same time, we have this high-level model, right? And then we compare the model with IPG census results. So IPG goes through placement routing, and then on average, the air, everything is about this, right? So this is uh, well-controlled because you can see the software side, the hardware side, our uh, modeling air. It's uh, at the similar category, right? So then overall, the IR is well controlled. So then uh, what we did is uh, this is automated solution, and then we map to the IPGA, right? So that IPGA can be used as a prototyping tool for the actual SOC. And then we compare with the CPU right, across a bunch of uh, you know, benchmarks, including AlexNet. So when it's bigger, actually, you have a better result. And overall, we have about 84.7x speed up. So this is the SOC on top of IPGA that, that has this uh, speed up uh, against to the CPU results. Uh, any questions? Yes. I'm just curious about what the power usage of the CPU was in comparison, because I don't see it. Oh, yeah. The CPU, I think it's roughly 80. 80 to 90 watts. Yeah. Sounds right. Right. Okay. So then let me quickly go through. I'm almost done. So uh, it's a 2.33. So I guess I can have five, six minutes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, I don't know whether you guys heard about FCUDA, right? So this is, uh, if you love GPU, <laughs> uh, this is um, working, trying to work with GPU, right? So uh, you can see, right, GPUs, IPGAs, uh, they are all accelerators, right? In general, people think GPU is easier for programming, right? Especially after CUDA is out, you know, you, you use CUDA and you can program for all kinds of different type of GPUs, right? But for IPGA, it may not be the case. If you write a very low code for that links, you may not port that to Altara. I don't know whether you tried it or not. It's a lot of trouble. Or you write very low code for one type of Altara IPGA, and you want to port it to another type of Altara IPGA, it's not that portable either. Right? So this can be a, actually a quite a troublesome. and It can become a barrier for IPGA. Right? So that's also an advantage of high-level census. If we write the higher-level code, mainly focusing on the behavior and algorithm, and then let the high-level sensors to determine all the little you know, I.O. and all those little things for you, right? Then you become more portable, okay? So for this one, what we do is, uh, let's see how, how can we improve the overall IPJ programmability, right? So then uh, our uh, motivation is, okay, well, uh, you have the C, C++ code together with CUDA, right? So, you know, when you write the CUDA code, you do have the host side, and then you have the device side, right? The device side is the CUDA code. 
And then uh, there are so much CUDA code. Okay? So then what if I can build a flow from CUDA to IPGA, right? And then I can compare my IPGA solution with this GPU solution and see whether I can have comparable results with lower power or lower energy, right? Uh, or uh, if that's the case, if, if I have a heterogeneous computing, let's say in the cloud, you have both GPU and IPGA, right? The users do not really care which one you use as long as uh, you give me good results, right? So then people can just write CUDA code because this is still the dominating language for GPU. It's, it's just because NVIDIA just dominate the, the market, right? So then you, you can just write a common CUDA code and it's up to me to make the decision for you to either map to GPU or IPGA, right? So you don't need to write another piece of code to specifically target IPGA, right? So you can see this can really help us to make sure we can, first of all, uh, minimize the design time, right? So you do not do replicate work. Second of all, you can really facilitate this kind of uh, design space analysis and or based on the characteristic of workload and really map to the uh, right uh, platform, right? To, for the maximal gain in terms of energy efficiency and the performance uh, uh, right, improvement. So as a result, we actually built FCUDA. So this uh, started uh, about uh, nine years ago, okay? And uh, about 15 people involved and, and along the way we also won some awards and, right? And the, the, the goal is, uh, right, so you have the CUDA code and then we have some pragma, some simple pragmas to tell uh, the hydrosynthesis which part is for communication, which part is for com uh, you know, computation. And then we do this transformation, this FCUDA transformation, and then gen generate sensible C code, and then go through high low sensors. High low sensors become a backend tool for us, and then generate RTL. And uh, this become open source, right? So if you are interested to play with it, and uh, then we actually build the uh, uh, NOC, so NOC with, with FCUDA cores and the hierarchical bus that can uh, support uh, hundreds of uh, uh, FCUDA cores, right? So then you can uh, study different architecture even, you know, like a multi-core, many-core architecture. You can use this to study it, map to the IPGA, and then just do architecture evaluation that way, right? Okay, so finally, like two minutes. Uh, so what's in the future, right? So. Uh, we propose an idea called Mega Brain, right? So it's actually also inspired with uh, the Catapult project, right? I, I was chatting with a couple of researchers in the Catapult project. And then, uh, so the Earth Scale, oh, so Catapult really is an Earth Scale RPG network, right? So, but uh, can we use it and leverage that as human brain, right? So. Human brain it has 100 billion neurons, average of 7,000 uh, synaptic con connections each. So if you compare with IBM TrueNOS chip, right, it uh, has 5 billion transistors, but you only have 1 million neurons and 256 million connections. So just from like a pure computation capacity, how many thousands of TrueNOS can really match this capacity? Right, so looks like we really need a, a Earth scale IPJ network, something like a Catapult or Catapult V2, if we want to do something like a Brain, right? So, so this is a new vision, while we'll propose to leverage Earth scale network IPGA devices to achieve the mega Brain goal, right? If successful, you can enable intelligent IoT devices, systems, by like robots or variable device to interact with us just like very naturally, right? Because there's a brain behind it, right? So of course, uh, you know, this, I think this uh, vision is uh, uh, quite ambitious because, uh, you know, biologists still kind of struggle to understand how the brain works, right? So yeah, for a specific task, like AlphaGo machine can do very well, 
But how about other things? How about emotion? How about uh, creativity? And all that, right? So there is no algorithm to really go behind it yet, right? But from uh, the design, from the kind of uh, overall challenge uh, point of view, right? So there are quite some challenges, right? Even with the recent advances in Hello Census, difficult to compile a piece of Hello code all the way to IPGA. But also critical need for domain-specific application level optimization in machine learning. And then how about the reliability, congestion, and unpredictability in the network? And then deliver the low latency solution, right? Uh, that require both fast network infrastructure and the computation. So we propose several directions, right? Optimize the machine learning library. So the work we did for RRCN is along this way. We come up with some high-level uh, high census IPs, right? And then domestic uh, uh, specific programming for many IPGA systems. So it's not focusing on one IPGA. It's for many IPGA. And then also how to build resilient, reliable IPGA network and eventually uh, brings inspired IPGA fabric. So in conclusion, right, so there are many aspects of cognitive computing, right, from system building, algorithms, machine learning, acceleration, right, et cetera, et cetera. And then they demonstrate that hello sensors can be an effective method for mapping machine learning to IPGAs. And then we spend quite some time talking about system level co-design for heterogeneous computing. And then we mentioned about FCUDA and the new version of uh, uh, mega brain, and I think uh, I hope uh, you know you guys are convinced that we are in an exciting era of AI. Right, so let's work on it. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, you know, uh, both students, of engineers, and some faculty, and some uh, uh, funding agency. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Okay. I would happy to answer questions. Okay. All right. So we do have a couple of minutes for the questions, if anything's interesting. Actually, I, I had a question about sort of the, the FCUDA one. Yeah. Um, quite often, the types of processing that you would do in a GPU, because they have so many small threads, the capability of handling so many small threads, yeah. versus what you would build ideally for an FPGA would be different. Right. Maybe a smaller number of larger threads. That's right, yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how, how do you, what is your feeling about that? Oh, yeah, so that's uh, actually a very good point. Uh, so uh, FCUDA is exactly dealing with that. So, uh, so you know in GPU, it's a single thread, multiple data, right? So what we do is uh, we replicate those threads. So you have a logic thread, right, working on different uh, uh, data, let's say in a thread block, right? So then what we do is we wrap around those threads and convert them into a heavy duty threads. Okay. And then we work with the heavy duty thread. First of all, we actually explore that design space there also, you know, like a concurrency, right? And um, uh, we even do memory partition and we can uh, do multi issue kind of customized core and pick the best, right? So uh, then uh, effectively it convert from this fine-grained GPU computing model into a customized core for IPGA, right? So the FCUDA is uh, basically capture the functionality through the CUDA implementation, then, then convert it into a model where we can handle for IPGA. Yeah. Does FCUDA then support the ability to split the workload similar to what you were talking before? between both a, an FPGA and a GPU at the same time. So take certain parts of a workload and break them off to an FPGA and certain parts and give them to a, a GPU, or is it only one or the other? Uh, right now, it's only one of the other. Okay. Uh, however, that's actually a very good point. Uh, so um, it really depends on the application itself. Uh, if certain applications 
Uh, of course, if you are talking about different applications, then it, right, it's natural to, okay, this application go to GPU, this application to go to RPGA. But you are talking about within a single uh, application, maybe some part running on GPU. So then it really depending on uh, how this application is um, um, uh, basically structured, structured, right? So for example, for the LRCN, right? So if we want, we have the image coming, if we do some decoding, right, maybe that's suitable for one type of uh, platform. And then after that, you push through to the deep neural network that's uh, suitable for a di different type of application. If you have these clear faces, then it can make sense to do this kind of study. Because uh, then you have to deal with uh, the communication across the GPU and IPGA. I think the open copy, that system can become useful in that scenario because uh, they are trying to build this common interface where this GPU, IPGA, they can communicate even through the common uh, memory and using virtual addressing. Then, then this kind of uh, study will become very relevant. Nice. Mm -hmm. So I also have a question about yeah. uh, you. You're basically uh, taking non-synthesizable C and creating synthesizable system C. Right. That seems like magic. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk just a little bit about sort of? Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So um, for those benchmarks we dealt with. Uh, we didn't really run into very sophisticated, non-synthesizable code. However, in general, we can do some uh, pre-processing, right? For example, for linked link list or dynamic memory allocation, we can, you know, try to uh, analyze uh, what's the maximum requirement, right? Just convert it into static, right? And some something, but. If it's a uh, very sophisticated, we cannot really do that yet, right? So it's a initial kind of study. Uh, however, you know, uh, actually we are thinking to open source this whole thing also, this hardware software code line. Uh, it's a, uh, a sponsored by Intel. It's a three-year project, right? With the software modeling, hardware modeling, and code design, the whole thing we plan to open source during that. Right, and then you know, uh, people more than all come to download and and add additional features on top on top of that framework. Yeah. Okay. Sir, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, why don't we speak? Thank our speaker one more time. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.